You are watching Dark Script, IT and Infosec tutorials. Hello and welcome back to Darkscript. Thank you for joining me again on this new episode and for not having a life. Today we're diving into one of the most infamous and fascinating cyber attacks of all times. An event that would literally make you wanna cry, also known as the WannaCry ransomware outbreak. That event completely shook the world back in 2017 and introduced a relatively new type of malware called a CryptoLocker, which basically falls under a category of malware called a ransomware. Now, CryptoLockers have officially been around since 2013 but the WannaCry cyber attack of 2017 significantly increased their popularity, and you will soon find out why. If you've been around in IT or cybersecurity at that time, you have definitely heard about the WannaCry incident, either in the news or on social media. Those events caused massive disruptions around the world, from halting services in hospitals to completely crippling companies across other industries. But before we get serious, here is a dad joke for you. How did a hacker manage to escape law enforcement? I don't know, they just ran somewhere. To give you some more context about the incident, in May 2017, the WannaCry ransomware emerged as one of the deadliest cyber threats the world has ever seen. Within days, it had infected hundreds of thousands of devices across 150 countries, and it targeted critical organizations and systems globally, including the NHS, Telefonica and FedEx, just to list a few. The results? Medical appointments were postponed or cancelled, logistics were delayed, and millions were lost in revenue and recovery costs. And you must be asking yourselves, what made WannaCry so destructive? The attack itself was only possible due to an exploit called Eternal Blue, originally developed by the NSA, the US National Security Agency. This exploit took advantage of a very critical vulnerability in Microsoft's SMB Protocol version 1, which is a core component in Windows operating systems that allows file sharing over a network. Eternal Blue targeted a specific vulnerability in the protocol that allowed direct remote code execution, effectively granting the attacker system-level privileges on any unpatched system. Now, prior to the attack, a hacking group called the Shadow Brokers leaked an NSA-developed exploit to the public, and this set of course included Eternal Blue. This leak gave cybercriminals a powerful weapon that until then was only known to the US government agencies. So how did WannaCry leverage Eternal Blue to literally unleash hell upon Earth? Here is the technical breakdown. Starting with a spread, using the Eternal Blue vulnerability, WannaCry was able to exploit vulnerable Windows machines running SMB v1, allowing it to spread laterally across the network, completely autonomously and without any user interaction. Next, in the deployment stage, once on a system, WannaCry would immediately execute a payload that encrypted all the user's files with a strong and nearly unbreakable algorithm, demanding ransom payments in Bitcoin in exchange for a decryption key. Last time I checked was around $300 per victim. But wait, here is the fun part. WannaCry also had a worm component, meaning it could automatically propagate itself to other vulnerable machines on the network, creating like a chain reaction that turned single infections into full-blown network compromises within minutes. It would literally land on a system, deploy itself, infect the host, and then start scanning around for neighboring hosts on the same network segment. If it found a vulnerable host, congratulations, it would use the exact same exploitation technique to send the exact same payload to the neighboring host and infect them with the same malware. It's almost like a pyramid scheme when you think about it, where you have one person joining a super dodgy organization, and then the next day, they realize that they've been so badly that the only way for them to pay the debt is to their own friends and sell skincare products to their demented grandmas. Anyway, WannaCry's destructive potential lay in its ability to spread quickly and lock down data in a way that was almost impossible to reverse without paying the ransom. Machines running outdated or unpatched versions of Windows were especially at risk. For a machine to be fully vulnerable to Eternal Blue, a few conditions had to be met. Number one, the computer would be running Windows 2008, 2008 R2, 2012 or 2012 R2. Number two, the operating system would be unpatched, meaning it wouldn't have applied the MS-17010 update. Number three, SMB version one would be enabled on the host. Number four, null sessions or guest access would be permitted, allowing unauthenticated anonymous access to shared resources. Number five, the SMB port number 445 would be open and listening to inbound connections. And number six, 
Networks without proper segmentation, like flat network designs, allowed Eternal Blue and WannaCry to move laterally without disruptions, spreading from one infected machine to other machines within the same network. So let's try to dive even deeper and understand the multiple components of this beautiful piece of malware. When WannaCry is activated, it deploys several components or files to carry out the attack, to encrypt the user files, display the ransom message, and attempt to spread across the network. And I want to show you a quick breakdown of each file and its role in the ransomware operations. For the sake of convenience, I am going to skip the extensions WNRY and just refer to each file by its first letter, like the B file or the S file. So starting with the B file, this file basically sets the desktop wallpaper with a ransom notification just to alert the user of the encryption of all their files, in case the user hasn't realized it yet. Then we have the S file, which is a Tor client file, and that file allows the malware to connect to the Tor network for secure anonymous communication with the attacker. And this file is used in conjunction with the C file, uh, the Tor configuration file, which is used for setting up the Tor client itself, the C file. And this allows the malware to communicate with its command and control, or C2 server, via the Tor network. After that, we have the F file, which is a set of random files that WannaCry partially decrypts, just as a proof to the victim that the decryption is possible after paying the ransom. Next, we have the R file. The R file contains the content of the ransom request itself, informing the victim of the ransom amount and the payment instructions in Bitcoin. Then the T file is the primary encryption executable that scans the system and encrypts the targeted files with a strong encryption algorithm. The U file is the decryption tool that is intended to be used after the ransom payment to decrypt the victim's files. Next, we have a file called taskdl.exe. That's just a cleanup executable or utility used to delete unnecessary files or artifacts after the malware does its thing. And then there is another executable file called taskse.exe, which is used to display the decryption tool for users on RDP sessions and allows them to view and access the decryption interface. Next, we have a file called msg, and that's just a ransom request message translated into multiple languages to communicate with victims worldwide. And they did a pretty decent job with the translation, I have to admit. Additionally, I noticed that when the malware deploys, there are four more files containing eight zeros with different extensions. The first one has a .pky extension, and is basically a public key, or more specifically, an RSA 2048-bit encryption key that is used to encrypt the victim's private decryption key for extra security. Then we have a .res file. This file contains the data that WannaCry uses to interact with the command and control server, like connection strings and credentials and so on. The third file has a .eky extension. That's the target private decryption key, which is encrypted with the RSA public key, ensuring that only the attackers can release the decrypted key after paying the ransom. And the fourth one has a .dky extension, the decryption private key which is provided to the victim after the ransom payment to unlock their files. There are two more files which seem like duplicates of previous files but with different extensions. One of them is called wannadecryptor.exe and that's the main decryption executable which is identical in function to the U file but used for decrypting files post-ransom. And the second file is called pleasereadme.txt, and that's a simple plain text version of the ransom demand containing the same message as the R file. At least they said please, unlike all these rude developers out there ordering you to read me in uppercase. The last file is a dropper called double pulsar that basically loads the malware into the system and allows the initial infection through a backdoor component. Now, a dropper, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, is a type of program used to drop or to install other malware components onto a target system. Its main function is to deliver and deploy the actual malicious payload, such as ransomware, spyware, or any other form of malware, without directly performing any malicious action. Typically, droppers are designed to evade detection by security software, making them appear harmless or hiding their activity long enough to install the malware without triggering any alert. For more technical information, I encourage you to read my full article WannaCry and the Cyber Kill Chain on www.darkscript.org slash media slash articles. 
Now, you might be asking yourselves, how was this global menace finally stopped? Check it out. Marcus Hutchins, a British cybersecurity researcher, reverse engineered the malware and apparently discovered a kill switch in the WannaCry code. And the ransomware was basically programmed to contact an unregistered domain before encrypting the files. So the malware would only activate if one condition was met. And the condition was being unable to resolve that long DNS name you see on the screen. And the logic was fairly simple. If the host cannot resolve this non-existing domain name, then release the beast. What do you think Hutchins did? He purchased and registered this unknown domain and effectively halted the spread of WannaCry. Now, that move didn't decrypt the data already affected, but it did prevent further infections by triggering the kill switch whenever WannaCry attempted to spread from one host to another. Now let's talk about the countermeasures introduced for Eternal Blue. In March 2017, Microsoft released a critical security patch called MS17010 that practically fixed the SMBV1 vulnerability, Eternal Blue. Unfortunately, many organizations had delayed patching their systems, leaving them exposed and vulnerable to the attack. In most cases, the infections were linked to legacy systems, insufficient update policies, and lack of awareness to this weakness. For businesses relying on old versions of Windows or running on patch servers, WannaCry spread like wildfire, especially in environments with weak network segmentation. Can you imagine that this whole madness could have been prevented or at least the impact could have been significantly minimized by simply following common best practices like downloading a freaking Windows update or setting up standard authentication and access control policies or configuring simple network segmentation and for crying out loud not exposing SMB shares to the public and today these things are considered common knowledge even axioms to some expert in the field but it took a crisis like this to make IT administrators switch from oh I just skipped 17 patch Tuesdays in a row to, dude, it's already Wednesday. All right, that was a historical and technical breakdown of the WannaCry outbreak. Now, you want a live demo and I just happen to be in the mood to fuck shit up. So we're going to move to my lab environment where I'll demonstrate the attack and hope it doesn't spread across my network. I'm kidding, by the way. If you ever try this at home, make sure you use a virtual and sandboxed environment completely isolated from your other devices. I can't stress this enough. And as always, remember this demo is only for educational purposes, only. So whatever you do with this knowledge is ultimately up to you. Cool, so this is my lab environment. I have two versions of WannaCry, as you can see, one for 32-bit and one for 64-bit. This is my vulnerable Windows 2012 R2 machine. You can tell that SMBV1 is enabled. The target IP address is 192.168.179.20 and port 445 is listening as expected from an SMB server. Let's return back to my attacker's machine and run a quick nmap scan that will enumerate the target and tell me if port 445 is open, which it is. I could also run a more aggressive scan using SMB scripts to determine whether the target is specifically vulnerable to Eternal Blue or not, but we already know this, and we can also use the Metasploit framework to find out. Let's start Metasploit and search for Eternal Blue. I'll start with a module that only performs a scan against the SMB service and returns whether the target is vulnerable or not. Now let's check the available options for this module. It looks like we only need to set the remote host address and the local host interface address. Now I can run the scanner and see for myself that the target is indeed vulnerable. Let's proceed with the exploit now. I'll select the PSExec module which defaults to a meterpreter reverse TCP payload. Let's check the options again. So I need to set the local host to my attacker's internal IP address, 192.168.179.10, then set the remote host to the target IP address, which is 192.168.179.20, and send the exploit. It didn't take too long, and I already have an interpreter shell. If I check my permissions, I can see that now I'm logged in as system, so I can do pretty much anything I want now. Let's look for a convenient path to drop my exploit, something like this master user. I'll navigate to its desktop, 
you can see a bunch of confidential documentation like passwords, secret documents, bills and other important stuff. I think I'm gonna run the malware in the temp folder. So now that Eternal Blue has been exploited and given me access to the system, I can finally deploy my WannaCry malware and execute it remotely. I'll upload the 64-bit version to the temp folder. Just so you can see it for yourself on the Windows graphical interface, the malware has indeed been uploaded to the temp folder. And now all that's left is to go back to the shell, navigate to temp again, and execute the malware. Go! Now you can see the WannaCry files being deployed in the temp folder. It will only take a few seconds before the wallpaper changes and the ransom notification appears. Here is the notification with the language selection and the timer. Here is the wallpaper. And here is the proof that the file content has been encrypted by the malware. I don't have 300 bucks, so I'm just going to revert this machine back to its last snapshot because we are responsible administrators and we run backups. That's it, that was WannaCry and Eternal Blue in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. And that's all for today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the session and that it didn't really make you wanna cry. Feel free to leave a comment or ping me directly if you want to recommend any new funny ideas for upcoming tutorials. And please, for the love of God, if you like the content, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, share it on your social media, and hit that like button really hard. And together maybe we can save 300 bucks and pay my ransom. I still got 19 hours left. So stay connected, stay safe, and keep protecting what really matters. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.